good morning everyone am i audible kindly write in the check box if we are audible yes uh, yes kati you can start yeah we can hear uh, you good Good morning, everyone. I, Ms. Kethi Ghavali, branch mentor, IEEE VSIT student branch, welcome you all to Mind Quench, the quarantine special web webinar series by IEEE VSIT student branch. I hope everyone is doing well. Today's webinar on why and how to do undergraduate research in uh, an academic institution will be delivered by Dr. B. Satyanarayan. Sir is a scientific officer at TIFR, Mumbai, and secretary IEEE Bombay section. He is a PhD in physics from IIT Bombay. He works in the Department of High Energy Physics at TIFR since 1983. He has worked on many major experiments, including a series of underground experiments at Polar Goldfield, D0 experiment at Fermilab, Chicago, and CMS experiment on LSD at CERN, Geneva. He has also been engaged in building a mega science experiment called ICAL at the proposed India-based Neutrino Observatory near Madurai. He has been a recipient of IEEE Bombay Section's Outstanding Volunteer Award and IEEE Headquarters MGA Achievement Award. He has published more than 200 research papers and proceedings in national and international journals and conferences besides scores of invited talks. Sir, we are honored and glad to have you with us for today's webinar. A kind request to everyone to kindly keep their mics on mute for a smooth conduct of the webinar. If you have any queries, you can write them in the chat box. I would now request Sir to kindly take the session again. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Sir. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, and also, uh, I hope you are all doing well uh, in these trying times. Uh, please take care and stay safe. Um, it's also having said that it's probably a good opportunity for us uh, to utilize our time uh, while uh, sitting at home and taking care of ourselves and families. Uh, also, maybe engage ourselves in some useful uh, uh, things, events like this. And uh, so I must straight away uh, thank, uh, congratulate and thank uh, Dr. Sarika Chawan and uh, her entire team at uh, BSIT for uh, taking up such a nice initiative and I also saw that uh, there are several stalwarts uh, actually uh, talking in this uh, series and I hope at the end of the day this will be something of use and uh, we will have some takeaway uh, back all of us. I mean those who are talking, those who are listening and, and so on and so forth. So uh, thanks once again. So uh, as ma'am uh, just now uh, mentioned that I'm going to uh, speak a little bit uh, on uh, uh, just a minute, let me look at my pointer. Yeah, uh, the why uh, the research, which is normally considered as a prerogative of research institute, uh, could also be very meaningfully done, firstly, in an academic institutions, of course, like BSIT, for example, uh, but more so, even more beyond that, uh, it could also be done at a, at a good level, I would say. I will try to kind of justify this even by the faculties and students of undergraduate level need not be, you know, let us say masters and uh, graduate students and so on. So this is uh, slightly a tall order. Uh, I think I have been given something like about 40 minutes. I have a lot, lot of material and lots of slides. Uh, I hope I will do justice uh, to what I wanted to say at the end. But more important thing is, I think, is the engagement, as I said. OK, uh, since we are talking to uh, not only students, but also to their teachers and uh, learned people. And uh, whenever a teacher, uh, he or she always say that you must define uh, first what you are speaking about. So I'm actually taking that uh, seriously. Uh, when you talk about academics, of course, they relate to kind of work done. Uh, it could be schools or colleges or universities, whatever, uh, especially uh, which actually involves study. And uh, I would uh, take it further and say it's actually reasoning 
rather than practical or technical skills, right? I mean, we, we learn how to reason certain things. Doesn't matter which subject that is, right? So that is what academics are supposed to be good at. Uh, you will remember, you know, there are always derivations. You say start from some hypothesis. These are the things, you know, you come step by step and then at the end you try to solve or prove or disprove the hypothesis. Research, on the other hand, uh, of course, goes logically in the next stage, but which actually involves setting up experiments. For example, if you see on the right side, you see a, let us say, a typical classroom, but right below you will see probably one of the world's uh, largest experiments here, which is actually shown here as a just as a representative, but setting up such large experiments and most importantly, you want to very systematically study something. What is the intention? The intention is always to discover new facts about it. What are these new facts which are quite different than what you study in the textbooks, which are already established facts it comes in textbooks. But uh, research institutes, research work actually involves something which you never seen before. So an experiment that I showed for uh, you know just a few uh, uh, representation. Now on the other hand, uh, industry is also something uh, where work and uh, sometimes processes involved in collecting. You start with some raw materials and finally you bring them into products, right? You make them products uh, in factories. Sometimes you don't may not mean really making some physical products out of it, but you also you know give what you call consultancies or services. All these software uh, companies that we talk about, we talk about consultancies rather than factories, right? Uh, of course, on the right you see, let us say, uh, one of the aircraft manufacturing industry just for one. Okay, now if I can summarize these three, which says. Um, the research can equally excel in universities, in bracket I said in students and industries as well, and I said equipment due to very specific resources, which means my claim is the research that I described in the second bullet could also be done equally well, A, in the academic institutes, B, in industry as well, because uh, you also have those necessary uh, infrastructure or resources, A, in terms of students in the first case, B, in terms of equipment in the industry case, right? So this is this is a claim. This is this is my claim uh, in the beginning. Uh, of course, we'll have to see how, uh, you know, I am convinced on the, how I could convince you and so on and so forth. But even before dwelling on to the other thing, when you actually take a research, you actually talk about, you know, generating certain impact, and then you attract, let us say, uh, sometimes good grants. You undertake, of course, more research. Then maybe you will try to publish what you actually researched into, let us say, findings and papers and so on. Uh, and then the institutions and management are happy because it actually gives a better impact. And then therefore, maybe the management will be happy to give you more grants because after all, you increased the branding uh, or the impact of the institution. So uh, it's like a it's a, like a nice circle around and one impacting the other and so on. OK, it all looks fine just on the theoretical things, but let us now well on. Uh, again, another claim. I hope you will agree with me. Uh, I say that uh, all of us, me, you, everyone on the call, we are all actually born as scientists, right? When we are born, uh, we are all born as scientists. Why did why do I say that? I say this because one of the main, I think, the uh, attribute of being a scientist is to ask questions. Only when we ask questions, science is done. So to that extent, we all have been asking when we are three years old, two years old, five years old. So we're all scientists. But unfortunately, when we actually, when we went to the school, uh, we did uh, one of these two things. One, uh, we actually started loving a subject, a particular subject, and we were so motivated, we said, yes, we want to build a career out of it. Or we started hating certain subjects so much, we were actually waiting uh, when the subject is going to be dropped, you know, so that uh, the earliest opportunity, suppose I don't like maths, I keep waiting up to 10th standard and then say, ha, huh, enough of it, I'm not going to take maths anymore because I hate it. Maybe I'll take biology, maybe I'll take commerce, I'll take something else. Now, somehow it looks to me, at least that's what I feel so, 
all this probably is because of that one school teacher who either you know because of which we started loving a subject or maybe we got scared and started hating a subject okay i mean please take this as a, a just for fun but uh, it's also to a large extent it is it is true isn't it because when we like a subject first time when somebody teaches you we love it and if you are scared we are scared for the rest of the life uh, but then what happens is if unfortunately if it happened to be this is the case we then say the okay we don't want to become a scientist but okay let us become a you know a so called safe employee yes, why safe because you don't have to worry about all this research and you know understanding and the logic and so on what i described before but unfortunately what is i think a little bit uh, worst or bad i must say that sometimes we also try to force our children uh, to do similar to what we did maybe you are not convinced maybe you are convinced uh, if you are not convinced i want to show this okay uh, i think everyone knows uh, homi baba of course uh, we uh, have to have a much more respect than all of you because i work in an institute which is founded by homi baba uh, i don't want to read this entire thing on the on the right for you but what i want to really say is even people like homi baba coming with a very aristocratic family he had to really try to convince his father that look i like physics i don't like so much of engineering so please allow me uh, to do what i like and i think i am quite capable i am quite uh, you know convinced that i'll be able to do better things in what i what i want to do rather than something which is forced upon so in fact he ends that letter by saying i therefore earnestly explore you implore you to let me do physics so so this is not a uncommon situation in all our families it does happen the child wants to do something uh, and uh, and the the parents probably have some other plans for it and so on right okay um but then see uh, still i mean in the in the way when we talk about an academic institution now why naturally uh, research becomes embodied in an academic institution i want to give a few more points uh, i would say you know teaching of course requires very very thorough understanding you ask any of any of your uh, teachers or professors uh, she will tell you that to give you a lecture for one hour she prepares three hours at home right and even if it is next year again she is giving that same uh, lecture she is actually going to again spend three three hours for every hour speaking so it requires thorough understanding of the concepts now but understanding as we said before in the first slide is the first step towards research we said you know reasoning in such a way to identify or to discover new facts is what we were saying as a research right so that means this first step is actually is already satisfied in the in the academic institutions now if you empower a child to think and solve an unknown problem i mean for example problems even in our textbook there are solved problems there are unsolved problems at the end of the chapter even if the teacher Uh, guides you to solve those unknown problems from set of known facts which she would have ta taught you as a as a main body now that is what an academic institution is supposed to be doing isn't it and now therefore if you if a child is empowered to solve unknown problems from known set of facts that's all one is talking about research in a core uh, you know um uh, concept wise so then the child can face the world well tomorrow if she comes to know some unknown problem unknown design unknown uh, let us say uh, as a calculations they will be able to do and they will be able to make a world of difference to the society you are actually sending out the students who are not just become uh, you know got a degree but actually they are also empowered with certain knowledge to solve problems which are he or she has no idea before she stepped out of the college i think this is this is the core of my talk the core of my talk is to 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 say and convince you that what we actually do in academic institutions even without us acknowledging it we are actually preparing people to think logically that means they are been made uh, as ready to do kind of research by the way research don't take it in a in a very pure uh, you know the se verbal sense of it research is something where i am able to solve problems which are not known even if you join a software uh, company 
you are actually working on a on a on a problem which you haven't studied in the school or college, isn't it? So that is that is what I meant by saying uh, the people, you know, the students can make a world of difference when they go. Now, why specifically the why did I why I'm talking today when I say academic institutions, I could have talked research in in all the spheres. So why I'm specifically talking about underground undergraduate research? Uh, of course, mainly because I understand that many of you at VSIT are undergraduates and uh, you are from the field of information technology. Now, undergraduate research is, of course, is a is a is an exploration of very specific topic within the as I said within the big field by an undergraduate student. But important thing is the student and his or her faculties, mentors are actually doing original contribution, just like what a researcher is supposed to do. Researcher is supposed to do original contribution. Okay. Uh, surprisingly, you'll find that this undergraduate research, even though undergraduation itself has been there with us for many, many uh, decades and centuries, but it's a recent concept. It actually become uh, a field of its own uh, recently in 19th or even more so in 20th centuries. In fact, in Germany, in the University of Berlin in 1810, uh, Humboldt's actually founded uh, and created this particular model, which we still follow the model of undergra undergraduate research. But as is expect in institutes like MIT, of course, which will motivate and create a big impact, they started a program called Undergraduate Research Opportunities Program called Europe in somewhat recently uh, in 1969. Then the UG research has suddenly become very, very popular. So that is about a little bit of research. Uh, this is slightly a, a busy slide, but I want to quickly go through uh, and try to convince you before we get on to actually talking about specific points. So understanding the research uh, process and how scientists work, I think that is better understood, understood at undergraduate level, not at school level, because it requires a little bit of maturity. Now, at undergraduate level, we also understand, the students also understand that the assertions, the assertions means you want to say, you know, conclusions, they actually require supporting evidence, right? I can't make a conclusion without a proper assertion. How do I know? Uh, also, the kind of ability where I learned a theory and what I do in my lab practice, I should be able to integrate them together. Ha, huh, this is the theory, uh, let us say Ohm's law, whatever it is, but this is what I did in the lab and actually proved or disproved it. And also at undergraduate level, I'll be able to kind of understand that how knowledge is actually constructed one after the other. I know this and like a pyramid, then I can do this, then I know this, so I'm able to construct a new one. And since I work in the lab, so I become familiar for lab techniques. And once the readings are taken in the lab, I know how to analyze this data, you know, get into some kind of conclusion. I also develop skills in the undergraduate level because of the lab sessions, and I'll be able to interpret of the results. When I have, uh, let us say, the voltage given and the current measured, then I can interpret and say, ha, huh, okay, there is a relation between the current and the voltage. There is a constant. This constant is, okay, resistance in my case. This is Ohm's law and so on and so forth. You are able to interpret these results. And more importantly, you will be able to work on an experiment independently. You will actually build confidence how to put on an oscilloscope, how to uh, how to put on an equipment, how to put on a power supply and whatever. You know, this is like now my my teacher is not hand holding, but I'm able to do things by myself. And most importantly, I understand by the time I come to the undergraduation that after all, every time I don't get success, success, but sometimes there are obstacles, there are failures. And, you know, I understand that I know how to kind of do this. And I think by UG, I'll be understanding also the interconnection, interrelation between science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Okay, so this increased you know, interest in this will also, of course, help me to uh, get uh, better interest in my careers, benefit society, and so on and so forth uh, by providing highly skilled professionals. And so developing these skills in critical thinking and communication. By the way, by the time I come to an undergraduate level, I'm also communicate reasonably well. I'm able to speak beyond my, uh, let us say, mother tongue. I'm able to speak in English. I'm able to communicate technically to my 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 students, my teacher, and maybe I'll go and present my results in a in a conference, etc. 
and now that is what is coming as a you know, as a leader as a leader when you say leader leader should be able to articulate able to speak well uh, and with multiple professions after graduation too because i don't know i might become a professor i might become a researcher i might become a software person i might become a management guru whatever it is so leadership is very important articulation communication skills are very important so of course at the end the university or the institution academic institution will ultimately get benefit isn't it because if you publish as a student as an undergraduate student and suppose even better if you are actually getting you know patents on your name obviously that will increase the visibility of the scientific you know in the scientific community your college will get branding you get ratings rankings and funding of course nowadays all the academic institutions are also are are expected to get these brandings and ratings and rankings right so see it is a win win situation for every one of us okay uh, that's fine it looks very rosy but it's also important in this case to get a, such a nice ambience and ecosystem in the in the academic institutions the management has a big role to play because they want they have to develop the research conducive um, ambience on campus including you know nowadays people build what you call innovation cells incubators etc now these labs what i meant it doesn't mean the teaching labs where you know second year third year fourth year students are uh, are uh, you know have to do some experiments in the lab no no i i don't mean that i mean really uh, research champions and also encourage the students generated as well as mentor mentor means your teacher generated research topics i mean it's not just teaching but there are some teachers who are probably little bit uh forward looking into doing some kind of research the management obviously have to support without their support the teachers will not be able to do much now you want to set up and efficiently maintain research laboratories as i said of course a college cannot set up research in all the fields but college can decide and now we will be able to only set up in this area or in this area one or two areas because after all everything costs money now what is also important is the management should be able to you know financially assist the students as well as faculties so that they can attend some conferences and when, when you know only when you benefit from interactions and you know networking with others you will be able to get exposed to the interaction so that's very important and uh, uh, ma'am mentioned about the ieee and the the fact that this ieee body of uh, vsit is actually doing institution should also fund uh you know professional membership both for faculties uh you know also students uh, they should they should facilitate you know expert interactions collaboration in the happening in the college so that the students who are already there they also get exposed of course the faculties get exposed i think management has a, has a big big role in 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 setting up such kind of ambience now one question that comes to all of us as uh, undergraduate students is say oh but research is you know black magic i mean what do you mean what topic i am supposed to do research and there are there are millions of topics that every day are we hear but then what, what is that i am supposed to talk you know this is the big confusion and this is the first question that comes to my mind right so what i want to do is i want to understand look for i mean i know world is very big but what are the topics that i know what i what i think i know right then i'll also ask myself okay this i know fine but uh, also what are the topics i particularly love do i love artificial intelligence do i love embedded systems do i love uh, microprocessors do i require love parallel computing what are the topics that i love personally what are the passion that i have that's fine but this is about you i don't care what you love or what but what are the topics that audience cares about i mean i'm going to write i'm going to do research it's not for me i want to also go and get myself exposed so it doesn't mean even if i love something but i also must have some idea about what the world at par looking at right so many of us studied sets and you know relationship etc so this is what i have drawn for you the intersection of these three sets is what is uh, what is kind of shown here and you say choose topics here so the topics that i am talking about are those in which you think you are expert at least you know well the topics which obviously you love but the topics that audience journals conferences everybody wants it so the intersection of these are the ones i should choose is it it i think it is fairly uh, reasonable right uh, since we are talking about this entire space which which deals with science technology engineering mathematics but i want to make you believe 
this knowledge that we are talking about for doing research or doing publications, etc. Believe me, whether you do a reason, reasoned investigation where, or whether you want to apply practically certain principles of science or you want to build something using technology and achieving certain amount of optimization, which is engineering, or you want to purely express some science in terms of mathematics, whatever it is, the science or technology or the engineering or mathematics, believe me, they all originate to the to the to, to the pyramid of knowledge. OK, and all of them are accepted with equal respect and equal uh, recognition. So uh, they, these differences of science, engineering, mathematics and you know, um, technology, etc. are different facets, different uh, different facets of of similar uh, same pool of thing, which is all we want to kind of work on, which is knowledge. Uh, this is slightly uh, a, a slide which is suddenly coming out from somewhere, but I just wanted to say, even if you think science is something which is Greek and Latin for us, okay, in your backyard, in your country, in your state, there are huge number of experiments, science experiments, mega science experiments, modern experiments, experiments involving thousands and thousands of crores of rupees are actually being done. Each of these line that you see here is, let us say, a science experiment which is investing 200, 300, 400, 1000, 10,000, 20,000 crores of rupees. I'm not sure how many of you even know about it. For example, this experiment here is actually coming in Nanded in Maharashtra. This experiment here is actually coming up somewhere in Tamil Nadu. This experiment here is coming uh, is already there in Pune. This experiment is coming somewhere else. Why I am showing this? Why I am showing these experiments to you? It is science, correct? But it involves large, large pool of engineers, large pool of software people, large pool of instrumentationalists, large pool of sensor specialists, large pool of, uh, let us say, detector specialists. So we don't have to look far to Western countries to understand, oh, what, where are the places where I can derive, uh, you know, inspiration or even maybe an opportunity to work on a research topic. So if you are having such an idea, please rethink about it. All those things you have to Google and find out where are the big science labs where I can go and actually land my feet on. I am going to talk a little bit more towards the very end of my talk about it. Uh, just a few topics very quickly to understand, make you understand that research can be done in undergraduate labs with minimal infrastructure using IT tools, using computer science tools, using computer technology tools without building a massive hardware is a couple of examples I want to show you. OK, one of such topics is the most crucial one, which is called mathematical modeling. OK, for this. All that you require to work on is a computer at best. There's nothing else is required because it is actually describing a system. A system could be very complicated. A system could be a bridge. A system could be a factory. A system could be a uh, very complex, uh, let us say, aircraft. But can I model using it purely from mathematical concepts and computer science uh, uh, background? This modeling and simulations that I do actually form a cornerstone of all science, engineering, humanities, economics, environmental sciences. Mathematics, mathematical modeling and simulation are doing things from science experiment to Bombay Stock Exchange. There's nothing else stopping you to actually work on this kind of a field. A model may help to explain this particular system and study the effects of different components and make predictions about how it behaves. I don't have to build worldly ceiling uh, before I go through the entire modeling and simulate and see this is my length of the span. This is the uh, uh, this is the uh, this is the uh, environmental condition. This many trucks are going on it. This is the load that I'm going to have. This is the you know let us say the the force that the 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 water is uh, the sea water is going to put. All that I can simulate can I can actually prove that a bridge of this uh, nature is going to sustain all this, or it's not going to sustain. Nobody will build go ahead and build a dam without actually doing simulations. So in all cases, the quality of a scientific field depends how well you are able to do modeling OK on theoretical side. Now, in fact, sometimes if the model that you have 
at the agreement you know with a theoretical mathematical model and experimental methods if it doesn't match it actually lead to advancement in that field normally when the numbers don't match we try to go back and you know try to back calculate and adjust it no we don't have to if something do not match it is not a negative result it is probably has something new which we didn't understand we all uh, i mean include we all know well you know when we do experiments in the lab if the, uh, if the numbers do not match we go back and back calculate and you know adjust it no no we don't have to maybe that is something coming up in new new science that we need to understand so also you know cost benefit merit of this activity it actually saves zillions of dollars imagine you built a a uh, 200 uh, you know 150 store uh, storied building and it actually collapses just because you didn't take care of the model so it's very 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 nice very simple way to understand for that uh, there are there is a tool called mc methods it's called monte carlo methods this is a a class of computational algorithms which very interesting thing you know if i want to solve a problem based on purely a deterministic thing all this monte carlo method says is if i can actually do a repeated random sampling a random sample okay it's not a, it's not say v equal to ir it's a it's a standard uh, numerical method right but no i am actually taking a random sample and use that randomness to solve problems that might be actually deterministic what is deterministic deterministic v is equal to ir is a deterministic thing okay if you give me i and if you give me r i can calculate what is v right it's not this if you if you think if you have thought that simulations and models are only used in physical problems no it's not but it's also difficult sometimes to you know to build things so you actually do uh, you use the random uh, sampling and you know uh, solve some kind of problems which are otherwise difficult by other approaches so in principle they can be used for any problem any engineering problem any computer science problem use which has a certain probabilistic interpretation we will give a couple of examples so uh, some of you may remember this simple fact that the law of large numbers integrals described by the you know the expected value of some random variable can be approximated by taking means of all these random samples so i take large very very large number of samples and take the simple mean of these independent samples to be able to get a very accurate result okay for example if i uh, if i take this picture if i show you this picture what i wanted to show this by is i i am i'm interested to calculate what is the value of pi we know what is the value of pi it is very accurately calculated we also know in a circle it's a ratio of circumference by the uh, diameter we say pi um, uh, pi is let us say 22 by 7 or whatever right how do i how do i suppose i say no 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 you don't take any circle you don't take any um, calculation but you show me random by using so called monte carlo simulation what i do i actually take a square of 1 unit 1 meter 1 cm doesn't matter that is a square i inscribe just 1/4 of a circle here right okay so the radius of this circle is 1 the side of this uh, uh, square is also 1 now what i do i stand in front of the screen and keep throwing stones into into the screen now i want to make sure the stones will only fall inside this one by one in the square the stones which are falling outside i don't care after large number of stones are thrown i go and calculate the number of stones which are sto uh, thrown here number of stones which are thrown here you can see they are marked as red and marked as blue okay how many stones i have been throwing here the number is here first i was showing very large small number and for every one i am able to calculate because after all you know that the square is a square area of that and the uh, and the circle is pi r square and this is only 1/4 of it so you know it is pi r square by 4 and i can differ the ratio of these two gives me a value of pi that pi is what is actually calculated here and plotted you can see when i take a small number of samples the pi is not coming to very accurate number 3.14 whatever but if i take a very large number of samples like 30000 etc you can see the values are coming almost close to my 22 by 7 which is a very deterministic number okay is that clear so what i'm talking about is you don't have to really uh did you know exactly determine how the calculation is done to obtain a pi i can actually use complete random sampling still 
obtain a very, very accurate value. OK, so the way I do it is I define a domain of what are the inputs to that I want to generate. Those inputs are randomly taken from a probability distribution and then perform this deterministic computation out of it. OK, and when I add all those results is what you saw value like a like a pie, right? So what is most important that we learned? What we really learned is first those stones have to be distributed equally. I cannot keep on sto throwing stones only, you know, biased way to only um, only to one area that will be biased. Of course, I should be able to throw to all of them. And most importantly, that I should throw a large number of stones. Then only I'll be able to get the statistics that I require. And you saw the relation between the statistics and the accuracy of the value that I obtained. So in case, once again, if you think Monte Carlo is only for science, please think about it. Lots and lots of engineering problems. For example, in telecommunications, when, when we plan a wireless network in a house and the design must be proved to work in all for the number of users, number of locations, whether it is in your room, my room. And what people do is they don't take the network hub and you know mount in each place and start measuring what is the signal and so on and so forth. What is important is using a Monte Carlo methods, I'll be able to I will be able to give you a distribution of the signal strength in each of these rooms, provided I know what is the cement blocks, how much wooden blocks, and this and that, which will go in the model. So it's very important. So the network performance then can be very, very well evaluated. I also told you it is used for climate change and radiative forcing. It is used in computational biology. Of course, AI is now there everywhere. And it is really a modeling that has changed the scenario here. Sometimes you might wonder the you know, evaluation of the risk and uncertainty, which would affect the whole world today. Like, you know, sometimes we call fintech, right? Financial technology, stock exchanges, and you know, investments, and all these have been able to simulate pretty, pretty well using using this. Of course, I don't have to tell you right now, even the way people have been working on the data coming from COVID predicting the way it spreads, the way it, uh, you know, what are the numbers that's going to happen and what is the kind of uh, relation between the numbers that we have and how to predict uh, with this particular model, how it is going to happen one month from now, 15 days from now. All this is actually coming from modeling and simulations, isn't it? We are all seeing it uh, day to day, every day we read in newspapers and uh, on the web. Some of these modeling when you do and some of you when you actually work on uh, particularly things like pattern recognition and so on, there are very, very conventional methods we all have worked on. One of them is, of course, Kalman filter. Since you guys are IT and computer science, I thought that some of you might have studied. Now, this particular technique is very, very deterministic, very clear um, uh, computational rather than deterministic. We start from a state which is probably, you know, it's called prior knowledge of a state. So what are the input? I go in and calculate what is the system state in the next step. And I also calculate what is the uncertainty on this number. So I calculate what is the state next one. And also I calculate what is the, what is the uncertainty. Using this, I based on what the physics model, physical model is, I compute. I say that, okay, this is what the things that I got, so-called PK and XK. Now, let me predict what is going to be the next step. This is like predicting tomorrow what is going to be the number of COVID cases. OK, so as I mentioned to you, after that, I will actually measure what are the number of physical points, right? Like in COVID case, again, I know what, how many numbers, how many people have been tested positive. I actually compare the prediction to the measurement, right? And then I know by using that, I will be able to go to the next next step in my computation and say now this is p k minus one, this is p k, right? And that means that now I'm making k as k plus one, and again I'm going to ask again do the game of prediction, and again come to measurements of the next step, and again I do the comparison and again go, which is actually a kind of iteration process. And when I sufficiently know that error between the measurement and uh, the, the the kind of prediction is sufficiently small, I'll go ahead and publish this and say, ah, this is what my model is going to work. It's going to tell me by May 15th, the cases in India, United States or Europe or whatever, this is what it's going to be. So very nice iterative way. Of course, Kalman filter is very old. It was used in most of the control systems, but it also finds an extensive applications in computer science. 
sometimes people don't want to make a very very predictable a very computationally you know intensive kind of thing like a kanval filter we say oh no neural network is something which we like so what is there in that to like if i have a straight line and if i ask you please give me the intercept and the slope it's very easy you uh, you say y equal to mx plus c and you say sir uh, c is the uh, is the intercept and m is the slope and very very good now if i say okay fine this line is there here but i add a lot of lot of noise around this line is still there you can see now your y equal to mx plus c of course will not work right now if i take and build a simple system which is quite classical kind of system what people call multi layer perceptron i give then the model is where the inputs are coming i give into so called an input layer i expect i want my slope and my in intercept as my output and i set a number of layers inside and what is the what is the model here the model is i run this kind of a network on set of samples like this which are already created by someone and each one of them i'm going to shoot and input and i try to get the output of course the output will be wrong in the beginning because this whole network is uninitiated untrained and so on but as i keep on asking you to get trained one after the other what i'm actually doing is so called these lines that you see from one to another the so called weights that connecting from one input node to let us say one hidden layer and one hidden layer node to the output i'm actually changing the multiple multiplications if you like or weights if you like which is designed as wij or wjk or whatever now if i have sufficiently large number here you see 6 million training samples then the weights get kind of adjusted something like a least square method that we follow for y equal to mx plus c as well then i can take another set of test entries and throw them on the input and see whether my output is able to come through well okay so these are kind of things uh, that can be done and of course they they work quite well they work quite well right and that is the method that we kind of follow now people take uh, to a level beyond and then we we'll say that okay we want to use techniques which are so called artificial intelligence based techniques in that uh, as well people talk about machine learning where the attributes like what what are given here the attributes i already know in terms of what the features are so if i want to differentiate for you between a between a let us say a triangle and a circle you know you will ask me how many nodes are there how many sides are there uh, i'm sorry uh, there is a lot of noise can can the can the mics be muted can i request all the participants to mute their mics Sir, we cannot hear you. I guess you are muted. But maybe the system uh, was not so good. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me now? Can yeah. You hear yeah me? Ah, okay. So, whereas in the deep learning, of course, even the features, even the features, what features to be able to, uh, you know, uh, learn high-level features, also of course come from. dl obviously this requires a much more extensive data label data compared to machine learning and so on but i'm not getting into those examples right now but what i want to what i want to come to is this slide where uh, as a computer science person as an it person i can actually train myself into this jargon of ai ml or dl whatever the way i learn things and there are huge number of you know space where there are opportunities all the way starting from a very very basic embryo selection to the genomes the, the you know so called voice medical coach or the the diagnostics uh, you know what we are going to speak little uh, later after this about the image processing able to scan and get the uh, diseases recognized out of it Uh, classify the uh, cancers and so on and promote patient safety and what not the entire spectrum of left to right in all these areas people are able to kind of use the inputs which are large number of inputs 
which are actually represented here. And you can see these inputs need not be only patients parameters, but also many, many their factors and then build a very complex network of let's say I mean it could be a, a neural network it could be whatever the system that you're building which is a learning system and train and test or whatever and you are able to kind of get an ultimate output which is actually so-called virtual health guidance. So AI in general which actually encompasses your ML or DL or whatever has a huge scope for people to do in academic institutions of fantastic work. For example you'll find in the recent context of COVID, people are able to kind of use large number of such kind of scans, chest x-rays or whatnot, and able to build a system either using each 2D, 2D is just a one scan at a time, and then train it and try to understand any abnormalities in a particular scan. They're able to also use as a stack as a 3D volume, also detect features which are not possible to be detected in the spatial uh, abnormalities, and then you know they kind of give a score to say that ha huh, this patient might be a positive case this patient may be a negative case but it's very very important to understand when we work how our sensitivity and specificity that is you know true positive cases true negative cases we are able to distinguish quite well or not but important thing is this is a good area of work where people are able to kind of take scans of such pictures and able to develop systems using learning systems able to kind of say for example here uh, one is able to kind of calculate what is the so called you know some kind of uh, volume of a score current score here volume is actually given in cubic uh, centimeter uh, to say that ha huh, this patient actually is diagnosed with problem after some cure after some treatment you can see the score has come down and after maybe working fully maybe the score has come to zero now these are all obviously not only just identifying a positive case negative case but it's also helping people to monitor as the treatment is going on how the patient is responding to it and in some cases you can even predict the patient's uh, you know future uh, state at some point of time right when 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 the treatment is given what is best about this kind of systems are many of these systems you will actually find okay another another line another system somebody here talks about using chest ray images and say that okay i mean very complex obviously 121 layer uh, system but what is most important is that they are able to kind of use a large set of labeled uh, data in this case frontal view of the x ray images which already comes with you know not one just pneumonia or some other disease but able to have a large number of diseases labeled uh, pictures labeled uh, what you call uh, data and now the question is you can use these and many of them are actually open source these days able to kind of do learning systems and able to work on them able to still improve upon them and maybe you can present you can you can actually publish them and okay in this case they also gave an example of these cases given to a real physical radiologist versus their own system and they claim that their system is doing better than even a radiologist and so on and so forth so what i was actually telling is that people are actually working on a large data set of thousands tens of thousands of images and which are obviously really available not only just the databases but even many of these uh, programs, many of these uh, utilities, apps or whatever, I mean, the software is also now becoming open source. This is a golden opportunity for students and faculties in a small academic institutions able to use this and able to build very good systems, which are, you know, I mean, you don't have to, every system need not go and become a product and patent or whatever, but you will at least do some original work, which is able, to, which is actually quite publishable, right? Now, when you do such kind of a research problem, normally what happens is you you start with a question, then you know do some kind of a background research, like what I showed you. Some work is already being done. Then you build your own problem and then try to test with you know whatever uh, those test samples and these and that, and ultimately get a analyze the results. Now I want to say whether my data is good. I'm very happy. I'll go and report the results. And if I unfortunately if my results are not so good then I go back and improve my model, improve my software, improve my architecture, algorithm, and so on and so forth. This is a slightly like an iterative process. So you'll actually find, obviously, when you are very young and very energetic, of course, you will say that I want to do many things, but 
as you do this is a cartoon of course as you grow older and older you'll find that there are many many uh, you know trips and traps in the research but this is just for fun don't get discouraged uh, but uh, i also want to show you one or two real examples where undergraduate students uh, at least they who worked with me are able to build systems which are at level with you know the real research goes on in the research lab here are a couple of undergraduate students who actually built um, you know in my lab let us say uh, a balloon based satellite a balloon based experiment they could fly using a balloon to about 40 kilometers in the air collected lots and lots of useful data and of course they were able to recover this uh, uh, this payload and you know of course it can be used and so on and so forth uh, the point is of course this has been made a big news just because these are undergraduate students these are actually second year third year fourth year students okay so it's not necessarily that uh, you know somebody has to be a real researcher to do uh, a big work yes of course undergraduate uh, students will do work which is at their level now many times one also when even at undergraduate level talks about you know when you have such a very very bright idea sometimes you know if the idea is really uh, you know top class sometimes you may don't want to even publish you don't want to even maybe apply for patent because maybe this is such a big uh, you know earth shattering uh, shaking idea that you want to keep it as a secret sometimes people also want to patent it because you already realize that there is a lot of money involved and it is also possible that if you don't patent somebody else might do but if these two do not mat uh, matter sometimes you may want to go and do a publication but how a particular bright idea that you have you want to go for a trade secret or a paper or a patent is something which you should ask your mentor and then you know you should be able to decide on one or the other right so uh, when you when you write if you decided to write a paper of course it's very important because only when you when you publish it your yeah, people will realize that you actually done you cannot say no 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 i have been working but uh, point is if i not published it obviously people won't know that i actually done so it's very important to publish it and when you publish it uh, you actually uh, uh, follow certain things you want to understand you say this is my problem and this is what you want to prove that it is an interesting problem and you also have to prove that nobody else had done similar work and you will actually provide your own idea your idea actually works you prove by giving all the data and details and finally you kind of compare it right an undergraduate students and they during the final year batch of students they could come to my lab and actually build something uh, which is not only published okay that is one part but the thing is they were able to kind of make such a simple system which we now use it by making around 30000 or 40000 such units so it's not just only publishing paper but there is also life of this work even after they leave right and these are all this work was actually done by students of your uh, your your age okay but most important i wanted to bring into focus the faculties here and the mentors because when a student does when a student obviously when he or she is doing the they are doing these things first time in their life i think they require a very very able mentoring particularly review of the work done review of the paper written review of the results that are put in i think it is very important that we must teach we must hand hold we must tell them what is correct what is not correct how to bring these results into focus really is there a, is there a work that is worth publication and so on and so forth because today when you don't do it with your name with the faculty's name with mentor's name this paper is going to be submitted to a journal or a conference by students i think it's not a good idea if somebody else rejects it by saying that you know something grossly wrong with the paper so it is i think in some sense the responsibility lies with the mentors and faculties to be able to groom the students because after all they are doing for the first time so the peer review is the is a very very important process of sending papers to reviews of course uh, i don't want to get into those details but uh, there are multiple types of so called reviews and the most common uh, review is so called double blind the person who is reviewing do not know your identity and you don't know the identity of the reviewer right and uh, there are also other modern review processes but the most commonly used process is so called double blind both for conferences as well as for uh, uh, papers so when you submit an article of course the editor looks at it assess it if the editor itself uh, himself or herself finds that it is pretty bad of course they will reject it but otherwise they will send to reviewers reviewers assess the paper and then 
you know that will be edited by uh, assessed by the editor and uh, if reviewer says yes of course it will publish and it will go for production but if the reviewer says no i'm sorry this is really bad uh, then it will be rejected but if reviewer says no no okay fine some little revisions are required so they will again go back here and if some further review is required if the editor thinks one more review is required then it will get go back this is the common most common method of reviewing process whether it is a conference or uh, whatever but remember it is very important that uh, when we give a paper we should be accurate we should be honest we should be able to tell that look i mean we are um, uh, we are we are we are honest in what we are uh, what we are presenting and and so on and so forth right and what are we give conclusions that must be coherent and we must also say that the implications of the research how it is going to be and what is the future work and so on and so forth only based on that you know the judging of a paper is done and really the 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 reviewers actually see each one of these points what is the merit of your paper of course sometimes even your grammar your spelling everything is kind of very important to when you want to do this kind of things okay many times when the paper is rejected it is actually rejected because either you didn't do a study properly or the results are not very conclusive the discussion has problem sometimes you remember i told you how important it is to choose a topic if you choose a topic which is uninter uninteresting unimportant uh, of course they will not allow your paper to go and publish it at the end right so don't worry in case uh, one of your paper gets rejected uh, you can always feel happy that einstein many papers were rejected in the beginning and uh, you don't have to uh, worry about if, uh, if if something is done rejected you can go back and then see where are uh, i made mistakes for example i should honestly take advantage of the reviewers comments right and then they say uh, what they were telling obviously there are some differentiation so that's why i will i should kind of go and uh, correct them sometimes you know there is also what is called so called impact factor uh, how big the journal is it is actually given by a number called impact factor i want to give an example of this paper here called uh, journal called nature which is an outstanding journal in the world uh, which impact factor of about 40 now if you want to publish such in that kind of papers you will re you will see i am showing you just for fun this paper has 3000 authors this is all author list here okay and but you write when you write when you publish one such paper in such kind of big journals uh, this particular paper was based on this nobel prize was given for so called god particle okay but so that is the kind of quality of work at some stage it goes through when you want to publish it in the top journal in the world okay i triple e since you are all part of uh, that body uh, is a fantastic source where more than 150 uh, top journals are being published in particular the field of electrical engineering computer science etc the world's top journals are actually published by i triple e okay the, it also organizes in you know, almost about 2000 conferences for year every day there must be three or four conferences that is a fantastic source for you especially students to start contributing and understand how to write a paper when you receive reviews you understand where where is your uh, problem where did you where did your paper did not fare well i think this is a good test ground to test yourself that uh, yes this is where uh, you know i have to improve and then you ask your mentors interact with the mentors interact with your uh, other uh, experts you will be able to kind of Uh, one day we will to publish uh, what is called ITP Explore. This is a repository, huge repository, world's probably largest repository, which is actually run by ITP body. So last, I want to just come to one point. Uh, please remember whether it is you as a student or you as a mentor and a teacher. It's very very important that we must be uh, ethically correct when we publish our work. We should be very very clear that. Uh, you know all that work that we have done is fairly done by us the results are uh, honest enough the the data taken is honest you have not manipulated data you have not copied from someone and so on and so forth so the faculties must hand hold and mentor the young researchers is important right when the way we do uh, we the way we bring up our kids in our family we should also bring up our kids our students also in the in this kind of uh, ethics of course we all must be knowing very well uh, what is ethics what is morality and nowadays people talk about plagiarism please remember that i think this is it is very bad to kind of stamp like the way 
the pictures are hung in a police stations. We still at IEEE, we receive a huge list of names saying that please ban these authors because they have, uh, you know, their papers have such a similarity index with some other papers. They should be banned for one year, two years. I think that is not a right thing. We have to do, we have to do a right work, honest work. Yes, that work may not be earth shattering work, but so what? But that is my work. That is my own results, my own data, my own you know hypothesis, my my own paper, the way I wrote it. Okay, so I think it is very important that while it is true that some of us are under pressure to publish, but we should never sacrifice morality for just getting a name, right? Of course, even the institutions nowadays they are all measured by certain indices, certain rankings, etc. You know there is what is called uh, national institute institutional ranking framework, many of your faculty knows. Why I'm showing this particular slide is to show that publications and quality of publications, IPRs and you know so-called professional practice and executive development programs, all these constitutes one third of the ranking. So it's very, very important, even at undergraduate uh, colleges and levels, that publications, patents, uh, IPR and quality of publications rather becomes very, very important, not only for you, not only for the faculties, but also for the management. Okay, uh, you must be wondering if I want to do work in research, one of the main problem is where do I get funding from? Because it all costs money. I'm not sure we all have ever bothered to check on the web to find out that there are so many government bodies, all these icons that I put out government bodies, the professional organizations, and many, many more actually offer funding, small or big, it doesn't matter. It offers funding for the faculties, it offers funding for the students and so on and so forth. I think we should, we must make use of it. There are organizations like European Center for Nuclear Science in Geneva. Uh, there is International Center for Theoretical Physics in Italy. So many of these organizations offer excellent facilities for internships and long, uh, you know, uh, uh, co-locating co yourself into the labs, both for the students as well as professionals and academics. We must explore this possibility uh, of able to go and engage with them and study. Only when we go and actually work in this research institute, we embed ourselves that what the research methodology means, what research is about, and, and you most important thing is you make connections with them. And when you come back to your organizations, you can still do research with them and improve upon uh, you know, what, what you have worked with them. But I think there are many such opportunities. For summer research fellowships for many of your students, there are three Indian Academy of Sciences. They offer 400 fellowships every year and 100 fellowships to teachers to go and work for two months, three months at any of the research institutions in India. And we don't make real good use of it. TIFR itself also has its own such summer research uh, fellowship, which happens usually between May first week to June end. OK, and these are very easy to get on. I mean, of course, you should be doing reasonably well, but the thing is we must explore and try to and that what are all possibilities. In your own city, you have an institute called Homi Baba Center for Science Education, which deals with how to embed scientific reasoning, how to set up experiments for uh, at school level, college level, etc. Uh, we have to explore, we have to get benefit out of those kind of opportunities. In TIFR, uh, I already mentioned to you about the research scholarships, visiting summer scholarships. Of course, there are also opportunities for people to come and uh, become, you know, work as research scholars. There are also opportunities where uh, some of you who graduate from your undergraduate uh, institutions can come and do wonderful work. So there are many, many such opportunities. The bottom line is we must be open to keep looking at what are the opportunities available. There are plenty of them. I can tell you compared to the times that we were, you have much more uh, opportunities uh, at the moment. So I want to come to my last slide. I want to say that undergra undergraduate research does a fantastic uh, you know, world of good to the students, the faculties, and to the institutions. Remember, this is win-win situation for all three stakeholders. And proactive role by institute management, which I talked about, which is very crucial for this activity. The research areas and topics should be carefully chosen. I think we talked about in the early on about this so that it interests to everybody. I, we also talked about the ethics briefly, must be strictly monitored. There is no excuse for this. 
the institute must set up, as I told you, the research advisory committee to be able to set up internal quality of this. Main important point here is the engagement of faculties and students with the research centers and other academic institutions is highly recommended. I, to I told you at the, at the end about such opportunities and active professional membership unit like doesn't matter, IEEE, CSI, IET, whatever it is, it should be able to act as a catalyst for the research ambience on the campus. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. Ma'am, I'm done. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, just a sir, minute. Yes, uh, we'll take some questions. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Am I yeah. audible? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, so thank you, sir. Uh, it was indeed an informative session. I, Dr. Sarika Chohan, uh, would now like to present some questions that students have asked, sir. Okay. So we can start with the first question, uh, which is by Pratik Baheti. Uh, the question is like students are uh, more inclined to go towards management instead of core engineering. How to promote core engineering domain? Uh, that's a good one. Uh, actually, uh, it's true. I mean, something whatever is uh, connected to, let us say. I don't really think that uh, the engineering as such is uh, facing such a problem compared to let us say science or other mathematics or basic uh, fields, etc. Uh, but if you're really your question is worrying about those who have qualified to be an engineering students, but later on go and let us say do management or even maybe directly go into the management, etc. One of the best way is I think uh, the students at large must really feel uh, proud in some sense for the field of study, and in this case, engineering and also the discipline. That comes from two factors. One factor is, of course, excellence in teaching. Only when the teaching uh, in an institution is to a level where the students are really motivated and the quality of the teaching is excellent, the students come back into the fold and you know feel proud that being part of an institute of this college or this branch and so on. And what is even little more important than that, even if I'm not an excellent teacher of a particular subject and so on and so forth, if you can actually make the right connection between the concepts of in the textbook to the applications that these concepts are going to go in into the research or industry or something like that, the students get connected so well. So what we are actually reading in the class today is actually has a good amount of connections to what I'm what is going to happen outside and what I'm going to kind of work on. I think many times one has actually lost this disconnect. I mean, it's kind of got disconnected by saying, yeah, OK, I'm just mugging up a few things just because I have to pass an exam and it has nothing to do with what I'm going to do at the end of the day. So I think that disconnect is making people a little less self-confident and then maybe they are kind of moving away from core engineering and doing uh, I mean it's all known that large number of engineers are being hired for software but that is not something negative about it you have enough uh, creative work to do even in the in the software and so on so I think the main two points I want to tell is the quality of teaching in the academic institutions must uh, must be good and more importantly there should be good connect between the concepts which are given in the today also I mentioned to you a couple of times that that kind of connector to the application. I think then we can bring back our kids without going to let's say some other domains, but it is not a it's not something really bad if somebody goes. Of course, there are many successful managers uh, who have been trained in engineering, so they have best of both. Nothing wrong about it. It is after all supply demand at the end of the day. Yeah, very well explained, sir. So the next question is by Akash Rohila from St. John College of Engineering and Management. Uh, he is asking like as an in undergraduate from a private college, what can I do in terms of research field rather than becoming a professor in most of the cases in India? Even I agree with this. <laughs> <laughs> now again, just like what I mentioned uh, in the previous uh, question, uh, what is wrong in becoming a professor? Uh, I, 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 I hope some of you know a real towering personality by name Richard Feynman. Uh, 
he may not be as famous as Einstein or Newton or somebody, but if you Google Richard Feynman, you will know what a gem of a person is. He once said, the best way to learn is actually to teach. You remember I mentioned that uh, all your teachers, uh, you know, prepare for three hours to come and teach uh, one hour of a class to you. Okay, so that itself is something if you are very, very clear about the concepts, you are able to kind of do research even in sitting in the academic institutions. Of course, unfortunately, a lot of time goes in teaching, so the time is actually less in the in the academic institutions compared to pure research institute. But uh, I think there are there are there are such many many such opportunities. Some of them I also mentioned to you. Some people, even uh, you know even engineering fields, there are lots of research opportunities. So research is not only connected with science. Research is connected with any discipline. You can do research even in management. You can do in humanities, engineering, and so on and so forth. Okay. And uh, in fact, many engineers sometimes turn to science when they want to do further studies. I myself, my first degree was engineering, right? But I turned to do science in uh, in for a PhD because uh, I find that maybe that is where my heart lies. So the, the engineering degree doesn't mean that I am going to be stamped as an engineer. I cannot become a professor. I cannot become a, uh, let us say, a scientist and so on and so forth. So the, I think the main point is that, uh, I mean, first point A, I, I still consider uh, academic profession is is also is equally respected or I, according to me even should be better respected. But at the same time, I think some of these opportunities I have talked to you towards the end of my talk, there are a number of opportunities. Please look around and uh, you will be able to work either inside an institute, a research institute as their own, uh, let us say, researcher, or you can always team up, you can always collaborate with such research institutions, even staying back in an academic field or an industry. Yeah, I completely agree with this, sir. Yeah. So the third question is by Siddhant Sharma from Shah and Ankar Kachi Engineering College. Uh, he is asking, like, what is necessary action should be taken, and what we as senior students can drive the institute and its students towards research and set their mindsets in that direction. Actually, I really like this question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, why I like is uh, here the question is already coming up with owning a responsibility. Here the person is actually saying that, look, I mean, I'm asking a question, fine, but uh, so tell me what it can be done. So uh, that means a person has a positive uh, kind of uh, responsibility to say that, uh, you know, I'm raring to go, please guide. And I, I like the tone of this question. So I think I mentioned a few points uh, about the institution's responsibility already, if you remember what a management of the institute should do, right? And I think you as especially the senior students can engage with these points with the management. Uh, that is, I think, very important. Of course, it doesn't mean that you go and fight with the management, but the important thing is to, to kind of convince them that these are the good fruits of what is going to kind of happen. So uh, we want to help, but you also please help setting up such kind of ambience. So you have to talk to the management about providing such. You should, I think the, the first point is you should organize Events events need not be big, big things. It could be talks, it could be workshops, it could be conferences. I think it should be all done in a college because when you bring experts and most importantly, very inspiring speakers, when they talk to you and your friends, it will actually make a world of difference because you never know which person talked about a certain point, which, you know, kind of gone into your mind and actually changed your life forever. Okay. And uh, I think you should take up to build you know, in your organization, in your own way, very humble infrastructure, platforms for development. For example, in your electronics lab, can I actually set up a simple structure? You remember, for example, we talked about how I can use open source platforms to work on, let us say, um, classification of uh, chest X-rays, um, let us say, to come out with some, it doesn't matter. In the beginning, maybe I don't publish it, but at least I set up a computer where I have, uh, you know, it comes with the necessary tools. Uh, I have the database of these labeled uh, diagrams, labeled pictures, and I develop certain, uh, you know, nice uh, submitted papers. And so it is actually helps you to set up thing. Remember that unless you handhold your juniors and, you know, uh, imbibe such kind of culture, that's very important to to bring more and more students into into such kind of network. And please remember, everything has a very small and humble beginning. Okay, and 
uh, more and more, of course, now incubations are all happening in small colleges, not necessarily in only IITs and NITs. I think they are serving a good purpose of, you know, students come talk to each other and say, hey, did you, do you know that, you know, I learned there is such a network, uh, it's able to do this classification. I mean, it's very important to keep themselves engaged and mentors and faculties must ensure that these things are all being done. And uh, being at I, IEEE, you know, I come across a number of instances where, you know, sometimes third year, fourth year students, you know, they're actually leading such efforts in every college uh, very efficiently. You know, they're taking leadership, they're, they're taking other students, they're organizing events, they're, uh, you know, doing, engaging themselves into such kind of works, publishing papers, etc. But remember, people, when such bright young kids are coming up, they're being watched by people around and they're also being rewarded. What do you mean by that? If I watch a person, a student sending me nice papers to a conference, of course, I have seen it, let us say, then I keep in mind, yeah, this, this boy is only third year or fourth year or this girl is only uh, final year, but she's able to kind of come out with an independent work. So obviously the papers get published, but more importantly, since we are talking about IEEE, when we watch you, when we watch uh, the girls, when we watch the boys, we actually also realize their professional skills. And, and we know that, uh, you know, these are the people who will take up responsibilities in the IEEE body. Tomorrow they will grow up to even much higher levels and so on. And I can go on talking this forever. But if you want me to answer this in just three words, in fact, I want to use Nike's uh, words and say, just do it. I think uh, nobody will stop. Okay, sir. So now I will take uh, just the last question. Okay. Uh, this is from Professor Megha. Uh, she is asking like in most of the average colleges, students feel Google search is the research. Even if faculty is highly motivated to do a research project, students like application oriented projects with spectacular demonstrations. Uh, so could you give me your view when students ask, give me two reasons why I should take up research based project? Very nice. Um, I think, uh, of course, obviously this is, uh, uh, I mean, it's very, very important question because it actually brings the truth at the end of the day. I, I'm going to give a talk and leave the meeting and run away from here. Okay, but the fact what she asked remains for tomorrow onwards, right? So this is, this is that kind of a question. Now, I have slightly kind of pragmatic answer to this. The question is that if I'm bootstrapping activities in my very humble way in my institutes. I will not try to put all these big constraints and say, I want to do the best basic research possible. I want to publish in science or nature. I want to only do pure research. I don't want to get into, you know, doing building little, little devices. Not necessary, not necessary. I can really start in a very pragmatic way. I know my kids will be very happy at the end of the day. If they write, if they go to Alameda Road, get all those little little components, put it together, write these ten lines of C code, and they see this uh, this uh, this uh, this unit, you know, robot or whatever they call, is actually able to run, and they feel very happy. They put it on their Facebook. They 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 feel very great. Why not? That's fine, right? That is a small happiness for them, and that need not be a paper that you can write about. Obviously, it is a small work, but at the end, you are actually you are actually making them a little bit tuned to okay the research bent of mind maybe you are luring them you are actually bringing them into that idea that i have something very basic in my mind i go ahead and you know do what can be done at the work maybe i'll set up something and at the end the results are there luckily if the unit doesn't work on the first day i'm very happy because i will go and actually uh, you know what do you call um, deeper and in the process i learn more things namely so what i'm saying is if the students pull you as a faculty, if they pull you towards doing so-called application-oriented research, whatever you call, okay, let that be. It's not a problem at all. But at the same time, if you can really engage closely with them and say, suppose somebody is building a, 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 a moving robot, but without even understanding the sensors that are involved, they only see a signal that is coming into um, Arduino or whatever that is, 
So I have to tell them, look, these sensors work like this. This is what it's made of, and this is how uh, this is the physical parameter. This is how the electrical signal. These sensors work this way. This is how you can improve. I think one could embed, embed uh, a little bit such kind of interesting facets of that work. It cannot be one day work. It cannot be one year work. And also, given the fact that many of the institutions doesn't have the real infrastructure for doing basic science, I think we don't have to suddenly jump start with something. I think we can go in a in a small way, and at the same time, then you as a faculty can lead by example by actually working on material science, working on um, computer science, working on embedded system, working on classification, working on pattern recognition, working on uh, speech processing. They come and sh see over your shoulder, and they'll say, "What my ma'am is doing? What my sir is doing?" They will be drawn. They will be drawn to. They will be curious. But this is how we must inculcate that. I think it is not a one-day phenomena. It is a. It is a job. Somebody has to start. Uh, but then I'm sure it will happen. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for answering all these questions. Uh, yeah. So those were all the questions. Now I request the D. Vice Chair WI Affinity Group IEEE VSIT Student Branch to propose vote of thanks. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, all. I hope everyone can hear me. Yeah, I okay. yes. would like to thank Dr. Satyanarayana for being a part of the MindQuench webinar series and explaining the topic so carefully to all the students. The webinar has taught us how to use a structured approach to write a research paper, the importance of our findings, and adding them in the paper. Also, apart from increasing the knowledge about the subject so that it benefits in higher education and work, writing a paper develops a research ability and builds a rigorous mindset. You will certainly benefit from these learnings. Thank you, sir, for this truly rewarding experience. Okay, to all the webinar attendees now, you will find the link to the feedback form for this webinar in the chat box. Everybody is kindly requested to fill it out before you exit the webinar. Also, you will receive your e-certificate for the participation within one week on submission of your feedback. Emails will be sent to registered attendees to fill the feedback just in case you missed it in the chat box here. Please ensure that you submit them by today. The email will also give you access to the presentation and recording of today's webinar as it will be uploaded on the YouTube channel of IEEE VSIT student branch. Okay, so that covers it. I would once again like to thank everyone for their active participation. Thank you all and stay safe. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Siddhi. Now I request uh, all the participants once again before leaving, please fill up the feedback form. Uh, you will receive your certificates on your email ID. And kindly, once you are done with the uh, filling up the feedback form, kindly leave the meeting. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Once again, I'll be in touch with you. Yeah, thanks, ma'am. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you very much, all your faculty members as well as students who made this uh, possible. I really congratulate you once again, and I also wish you all the best for the coming up uh, uh, events as well. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you. Bye bye.